Welcome back to another episode of Lost in the Farmer's Market Garden Shorts. Today we'll be talking about Swiss chard, which continues our cold season crop conversation. Now the scientific name for Swiss chard is Beta vulgaris, subspecies vulgaris. Huh. Name so nice, they named it twice. <laughs> well, I mean, there's more to that, actually, because it says, because in parentheses, there is the Cicla group and the Flavescens group. Now, I swear Flavescens sounds like it should be an R&B group. Yeah, yeah, Flavescens. I'm telling you, I, I copyrighted that. Y'all can't have it. Flavescens and the rhomboids. That's totally what I'm going to go with. Anyway, what's interesting about that is that Swiss chard has the same scientific first two names as common beet because they are directly related. Swiss chard is a derivative of beet. And when and its parentage actually is very interesting because it originated from sea beets, Beta vulgaris subspecies maritima, which possibly is where our beets derive from as well. And then the derivative for sugar beets, which were used Interestingly, so that Napoleon could avoid sugar issues during his wars. But, I, that's totally unrelated. We, we're going to talk about beets, actual beets, at some other time. For now, let's, let's stay on track here. So, Swiss chard, and beets in general, are in the amaranth family. They're under the chainopod group, though. Which is interesting, because so is spinach. Which means, Swiss chard... And spinach are ultimately cousins. I mean, you can kind of see it when you look at the leaves, and when you look at some of these common names, it makes sense. I mean, Swiss chard is also known as silver beet, perpetual spinach, beet spinach, leaf beet, sea kale beet, chard, of course, and Roman kale. Hmm. Now that's interesting. Roman kale, that's actually the name it should have. And here's why. The name Swiss and Swiss chard comes from it being found by a Swiss botanist, Gaspard Bauhin. Actually, there were two botanists named, but one of them is Germans, and none of the nicknames say that it's German chard or anything like that, so go figure. Ironically, its parentage, the uh, sea beet, is a coastal plant. So, this plant didn't originate anywhere in Switzerland, though it is a popular vegetable there. However, what's interesting is that it's from the Mediterranean, specifically Sicily, which is why probably it should have been called Roman kale in the first place. I mean, it kinda is, even though it's not actually a kale. It's relative, I suppose. Now, as for information here, um, specifically that Cicla flavescens, mm, flavescens and the rhomboids. Anyway, Cicla refers to the leafy spinach beet, which is pretty much what you see before you with my three specimens here. And then flavescens is the group with thicker leaf stalks. They're bred for the stalks being the vegetable, not so much the leaf. And I should note with my three specimens, this is a traditional green type. These are mixed, but there's some red and green in there, and as you can see, there's a red fully on display with this one here. Now, in a growing context, there is a price to pay for this flamboyant color. But let me get into the um, growing details first, and then I'll get back to that. According to the USDA, Swiss chart is considered an annual in zones 11 through 7 and a biennial in zones 6 and, and lower. And that is because heat is the enemy, much like with lettuce and spinach. They don't like heat. They're short season annuals for our purposes. However, in 8A, you can plant this in the ground up through November, and it'll overwinter and then fall apart the moment it gets hot in late spring next year. And that's assuming individuals aren't picked off by animals or damaging weather or something like that. So. It is an annual, but only technically. It prefers a soil pH of 6.0 to 6.4, which is a pretty darn narrow acidic range. In fact, that's surprisingly specific, but everyone seems to agree on it, which I find a little weird. Its exposure is full sun, but it could benefit from some shade in the afternoon to avoid the hot, dry sun of the afternoon, thus mimicking a cooler climate. 
it says in a bunch of places that its height can be 6 to 12 inches, but up to 28. Now, I'm going to have to disagree with the 6 to 12, I believe. The largest one I've ever seen grow, and this was a, well, in, my, in the test gardens, the largest one I've seen is 18 inches. In my professional career, the largest I've ever seen is 4 feet. Yeah, you heard me right. 4 friggin' feet. And I'll tell you how this grower did that. By the way, the width on average is 4 to 12 inches. One of my customers decided to use this super soil mix, which consisted of a bunch of things. Black cow, composted cow manure. Black hen, poultry manure. Mushroom compost, vermiculite, perlite, peat moss. And I don't remember the other ingredient. And they mixed together and made that pure soil. Now, just that is like plant steroids, cocaine, methamphetamines, everything added together. So this was charred was massive, like absolutely massive, humongoloid. The stem was about as wide across as this stick, maybe a little wider at the base. It was humongous. And you know what? It didn't care that it was hot in the summer. It didn't seem to care. It was, it was, the soil was so nutrient dense that the plant just roided out. It was crazy and amazing. I've honestly never wanted to replicate that, mostly because of the cost of getting all the ingredients. I mean, just think about how much money was spent, how not uneconomical that entire operation was, right? Okay, so Black Cow is a 50-pound bag. It costs like five bucks. Black Hen is a similar size bag, and it costs about seven bucks. The Perlite and the Vermiculite are going to run you into the seven to ten dollars a piece for the right amount, for a matching amount. Then you got the peat moss, which is definitely going to run you, you're probably going to get a big bale of it or something like that and have surplus, so it's going to be 15 bucks. And then the mushroom compost is easily going to be 5 bucks, so you're ultimately looking at blowing something close to 40 bucks for a bunch of super soil that will have explosive growth, but I don't think it lasts for more than two seasons, and once you plant cabbage crops in it, forget it. They're going to eat that. They're going to eat that up like it's chocolate cake. I mean, they're going to destroy that. So, I mean, it is an interesting idea, but I don't precisely recommend it. Now, that's totally off topic, of course. I am going to have to talk about the taste of Swiss chard. First and foremost, when raw, it can be bitter, and this is due to a oxalic acid content. Now, I've spoken of oxalic acid before. This is what gives certain things their sour tang. Um, cranberry hibiscus, purslane, they have a tang and that's because there's an oxalic acid content. It's not enough to do you harm, but it's enough for you to notice. Well, in Swiss chard, it can be a problem if eaten raw. When you cook it, this oxalic acid is destroyed and it doesn't matter. But when you eat it raw, it can cause problems. In fact, it can agitate a kidney stone issue. So I don't recommend it if you think you might have kidney stones or you have a history of kidney stones because let's face it and I can say this firsthand passing a kidney stone is not fun it's really really not fun and so I do not advise that not even on my worst enemy with that said though Swiss chard is a suitable replacement for spinach because it cooks down and goes super tender just the same except it's more nutrient dense than spinach so Maybe Popeye's cans were mislabeled and he was actually popping Swiss chard hardcore? No wonder Bluto got his butt kicked so often. <laughs> and here's why. Per 100 grams of raw Swiss chard, again, don't eat raw if you have kidney stones, 78 milligrams of sodium, 325 milligrams of potassium, 1.6 grams of protein, it has vitamin E, magnesium, manganese, and iron. But also, it has 122% of your daily um, value of vitamin A, 1,038% of your vitamin K uptake daily, and 50% of your vitamin C uptake daily. 1,038 vitamin K. Holy crap! That's a lot of vitamins. This is a serious plant for serious nutrition, and I recommend it and you should grow it. I mean, it's really easy. It's no harder than lettuce. It, it takes about the same care. 
Obviously, you would give it a leaf-oriented fertilizer, something with nitrogen. You give it the best soil you can, regular water, and you're rewarded with lush plants that look something like this. Now, these little guys are for sale at the market, and this is a starter size, but they'll get much bigger. And they're, again, 100% worth the effort. So, that's all I have for you on, you know, on the topic of Swiss chard. I hope you like this video. Please subscribe, like, leave a comment if you have any. Hit up the blog. And as always, folks, keep them growing, and thanks for watching.